Okay, um, hi, I'm Leonard Fatterling. I'm going to talk uh, together with Kai here about uh, KD Bus. Um, uh, KD Bus, uh, um, we have been working on that with a couple of people. Um, that's uh, Greg Crow Hartman, who you might know, Daniel Mack, uh, who's a friend from Berlin, and uh, me and uh, Kai, um, with a lot of help from Kishin Heo. Um, uh, to, to get started, oh, by the way, um, I would much prefer if this could be something um, interactive. Um, I mean, I got like 111 slides and there's no way in the world we'll cover all those. Um, the mouse out of the text. Like this. Um, uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so we will never be able to cover all those slides, um, but that's completely okay. Um, but I would much prefer if we can go into the direction that you guys wanted to go rather than me trying to uh, run through all those 111 slides. Um, anyway, uh, so interrupt me. If you have questions, just show up and... Uh, um. <laughs> so, let's get started. Um, a, little bit of <laughs> a little bit of background on this. Um, what's actually in very interesting about, uh, about uh, Linux is that uh, in contrast to most other newer West um, designs, uh, we never had a, a, a comprehensive IPC at the core of it, right? We had a, we, like all the newer ones like Mac kernels or QNX or Herd or, or whatever else, they started out with a really, really strong IPC. So they, they had massive calls and all these kind of things and everything was there and then they built all the rest of the <laughs> operating system around that. On Linux, we never had that. We only had I IPC primitives. Those IPC pr primitives are sockets and FIFAs and shared memory and things like that. So they, they, they are really, as the name says, very primitive. They don't give you much structure. Um, you're supposed to build of, the, uh, of that what, whatever you want. But um, it, it will not help you, like, all the way. Um, yeah, that's kind of interesting. So with, uh, with Dbus, the, the people from GNOME and KD community started to design an IPC system that would add in all the rest, right? that would uh, um, fill the void where all the microkernels had all the fancy IPC stuff that we would have something remotely similar. And Dbus, Dbus is a really good design, actually. It's a very powerful IPC. It provides you with method call transactions, and you know, method call is basically that you call a function on another process and you get a response back. Um, it uh, supports signals. Um, signals are basically how a process can um, notify everybody else that something changed on the system. There's something interesting for people to see. There are properties are basically something where you have an object, um, you have a value or something, and then you can change out, uh, send out those signals to notify everybody about it is, and you can introspect them and things like that. It's uh, inherently object-oriented. It's this uh, object orientation with interfaces, like you might know it with Java. So you have objects, interfaces, methods, signals, all these kind of things. It uh, supports broadcasting. So it's, uh, um, it's more than just that you can, can connect to one here and send it a message and get one back. You can actually broadcast it to all peers at the same time. Um, there's discovery, so you can actually figure out what's actually viable in the system, which services that you could talk, talk to. The next step is an introspection that if you've identified there's a service on the system, then you can actually figure out what it actually provides, the, the, uh, enumerate the objects that, that it has, enumerate the method that these objects have, the signals, and, and so on and so on and then also enumerate what kind of parameters do these methods have and what do they return. There's policy involved, um, which is always, I mean, we're building an operating system here, so we have privileged parts of the operating system and unprivileged parts. And if we allow method calls and these kind of things of IPC, we need to apply um, policy. Some things should be allowed and others should not. Um, there's activation, right? So yeah, if you have many, many services on the system, you would probably like to avoid starting them all at boot, but only start those um, th that are necessary when they are necessary, not any earlier. There's synchronization, which is a bit of more of an exotic feature of, of uh, Dbus, where you can actually use um, bus service names to implement something like a mutex. Um, there's type safe marshalling, right? Like you can put together messages, and, and these messages are, have actually a signature, like a type safety thing, like you can say this is a string and this is a 64-bit unsigned integer and so on and so on. And you can build structures, you can build arrays, you can build dictionaries, all kinds of complex things, and you can stack them in, in each other, and they're type safe. So if you try to uh, put something together, you, you s declare what it is, and if you um, decompose it afterwards, you also declare what you expect. And if it doesn't match what you expect, then you can get a, get a clean error. And there's security involved um, in, in all kinds of ways, like for example, um, there's a way how 
the kernel can attach securely information um, about peers to messages and things like that in a way that user space cannot take it. There's monitoring, so you can actually figure out what's going on on the IPC system right now, like who's making what message call and sending out which signal. It's like um, basically like as a, a real, like a Wireshark just for IPC. Um, the, the inherent distinction from, from, from the I IPC primitives that we have in, in, in Linux traditionally is that it exposes actual APIs and not just streams of things, right? It actually gives a lot of the semantics of, of APIs to the entire system. Uh, there's passing of credentials, right? I already mentioned that, that, that there is a way how credentials, identity information, like user ID, git, and, and things like that, are passed along messages and uh, um, are enforced by the kernel so they cannot be faked. There's file descriptor passing, so you can actually file, uh, pass file descriptors like to a device file or to any other uh, so fi um, file in the file system over dbus. There's, uh, it's language agnostic. You basically have binding for almost any language in the, uh, that we have on Linux right now. There's network transparency. The entire protocol actually works over the network as well, right? Like you don't have to talk, you're not required to only talk to local clients. You can actually also um, uh, talk to network peers. There's no trust required, which is a really exciting feature actually. Um, an untrusted um, peer can talk to another untrusted peer and it does not have to, to trust it in any other way because everything is validated in the same way. Um, so um, the message you send back is, is sent to the other side is, is validated by the other side so that you cannot confuse the other side and the other side can send it back, which is actually an exciting property that not all IPC systems have. Uh, there's an high level error concept, so it's uh, much more expressive than, than traditional, I don't know, Unix, Arno uh, error handling um, and so on and so on. This is just a rough overview, just, just a little bit of background why Dbus is actually a good thing, why we actually care about it. Um, Dbus, however, also has limitations. Dbus um, is uh, suitable only for control messages, not for payload. Yeah, control messages, um, like here, if, you, if, if we think about the example of a multimedia player, it's fantastic to send over those commands over Dbus, like play and pause and, and, and seek and, and jump to the next song and things like that. However, actually exchanging the real data, the real audio data, the PCM uh, uh, samples over, uh, over Dbus is something you really do wouldn't want to do simply because it's slow and it's not designed for that and there are limits applied and, and, and so on. So um, it's relatively inefficient. If you, if you uh, count out uh, what it actually does for a full duplex message call, you know, a full duplex message call is this thing that I mentioned where you do one message call to the other side and then you get one message back, uh, mes uh, message back. Um, it involves 10 copies, right? The message, um, whatever you want to send over, you have to first copy into the message then the message is copied into the socket buffer of the kernel then the message is copied out of the socket buffer into the kernel into the dbus daemon memory. Then from the dbus daemon memory, it's, it's copied into the destination socket. And then from the destination socket, it's copied into the, into the peer that is supposed to receive the message call. So those were five copies. Five copies. <laughs> and then uh, on the way back, you get another five, right, for the, for the reply. So that makes ten copies. You have full complete validation. Right? You have every time somebody else receives the message, you need to validate because everything is multiplexed over Dbus daemon, you hence have four. You also have four context switches. Context switches in the sense of uh, context switching between the multiple processes, right? Because for the message call in one way, you have to switch from the, from the caller to Dbus daemon um, to, to, to the uh, um, peer that you're calling, and then again back. So yeah, it's, uh, um, it's not very efficient. 10, 4, and 4. You should remember that actually. Where's my watch actually? I need to figure out how much time I have. Um, so it's, uh, it's not very in, uh, efficient. Um, the credentials one can send and receive are, are relatively limited, right? Um, in classic Dbus, it's only UID, PID, GET, and the SLNR security label, and that's it. It's not, not much. We will show whatever else it could be in a, in a later slide. There is no implicit timestamping, which is, timestamping is highly interesting if you, if you actually want to order things. And if you know, want to know, like reconstruct um, the, the timing behavior of what you got because we are an operating system where everything is best effort. So you want to know when it actually started because otherwise you can never figure out what actually happened there. It's not available in early boot, in uh, init RD or in late boot, which is an issue that particularly us um, who, who work on systemd and, and have to deal with all the early boot stuff is a problem because we basically, classic dbus um, starts as a normal service um, basically in late boot and whatever else we want to do in early boot, we cannot use that. And then we have to, to resort to gross hacks to kind of fake some IPC there without actually having sane APC available. 
um, there's the, the hookup with security frameworks happens in user space, right? The security frameworks like SLinux, because I mean the SLinux people generally tend to prefer if all the security hookup happens in the kernel side because they, for some reason, trust the kernel, but they don't trust user space. And so it's less than ideal if the, if the validation, if, the, if, the, um, if, if, if some uh, client uh, peer wants to call another peer, if all of that necessarily happens in the user space. Um, the, the activatable bus servers are independent from other system services, right? Like they are completely different than, for example, activation for system five init scripts. System five init scripts are invoked via system wide init scripts um, um, at boot, like real scripts. However, the, the debug services in, in classic debug daemon are, are forked off in a completely different way. Um, in a system five init script, where traditionally something where, where which would be started linearly at boot and not parallelized. Um, debug services have always been completely parallelized. So it's, uh, it's completely weird. If you do, depending on how you choose um, how to activate your stuff, you have two completely different uh, mechanisms. Um, then something to criticize is the code base is a bit baroque and uses a little bit of XML. It basically was created when XML was a solution for everything. Nowadays, I guess most people understand that, well, if you had a problem and then you solved it with XML, you had two problems. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, um, it's a little bit too much XML for policy and these kind of things for configuration, um, and uh, we probably don't want that that much anymore. Especially since most of the stuff that it actually manages there is completely linear, right? Like it's not a, a deeply structured thing that you would where XML would actually make sense. Um, I mean, I bash XML a bit, but I actually do believe that XML has uses, except that for this it doesn't. Um, and then here's a little bit more exotic one. Um, there are a couple of races involved um, because of the, the, the way it uses sockets um, that cannot be fixed in classic debus. You know, if you have activation where a service starts up on demand, you also want to have the other side in place where it can actually be shut down when it's not used anymore, right? And uh, that is inherently crazy in classic debus daemon. With kdebus, we provide functionality that we can actually make that safe. Um, okay, so this is just uh, a bit about, uh, about the motivation here. Uh, we should not forget that Dbus is fantastic. It solves real problems, right? Uh, we believe that the, that the approach is good. <coughs> the concepts are, are, are good, they're generic, they're comprehensive, and it covers all areas that we wanted to cover, right? It's also very, very established. Um, it's a single most used local high-level IPC system, and it has those bindings for all the other languages. So um, it's used all around the, the, the Linux um, um, uh, ecosystem. It's in the, in the init systems, and that's actually regardless of your system, your upstart. It is, uh, um, it is in all the desktops and in the embed embedded environments and so on and so on. So um, I hope this kind of makes clear that Dbus is absolutely the way, or at least in our opinion, is absolutely the way to go, but it has limitations, and we would like to uh, fix those limitations. I know that I will talk very, very fast, but that again, I have, don't have that much time. But anyway, I think this is a good time if anybody has a question so far about this to ask anything. But I don't, there's a question? No question? Okay, everything's fine. That's a good question. Oh, I do, that's interesting. <laughs> good, um, so no questions. Then let's actually come to the topic of this talk, which is KDBus. Um, KDBus um, is, a, is a departure from classic Dbus daemon. It's actually suitable for large data, right? You can actually send gigabytes of data around. It is uh, zero copy, not always, but it uh, is if you wanted to. It's uh, um, this memory that you can send over is actually reusable, so you can actually, with, with no effort, send the same memory a couple of times, which is actually useful if you talk to the same client a couple of times or things happen again and again, or you want to share resources over and over again with, with peers. It's highly efficient. You know, re remember that slice, uh, that slide, which said 10, 4, and 4? Um, Katie was two or fewer copies, right? It will actually just copy things to the destination, and then you get the um, answer back uh, with another copy, so that makes two copies. And it's actually uh, better in some cases uh, when we deal with zero copy. We'll come to that later. There are two validations, not four anymore, right? Like because we just copy to the other side, the other side validates it and then sends us something back and devalidate that. So two validations and two context switches. We switch one to the other, once to the other side and once back. So that's two. Okay, again, 1044 was the earlier slide with classic Dbus daemon. We are at uh, two or better, uh, two and two. Um, the credentials we send along with KDBus messages are much more comprehensive. There's 
user IDs. There's uh, um, Git, there's SE Linux uh, um, uh, labels like before. And now there's also PID start times, which is basically useful to uh, detect um, PID uh, uh, overflows, like overruns. Um, there is uh, the COM field, basically the process name as you see it in top. There's the, pro, uh, the, the thread COM field, which is a way how you can label your thread so you actually know which thread you're talking to. There is the argv array, which is basically the command line as you see it in PS. Um, there is exa, which is basically the, the, the binary that I actually called it, the path to the binary. There is a C group information, which is highly useful in system systems because we uh, can actually reconstruct information like what service is on the other side, what slice is on the other side, and whatever else is on the other side, and all of that in a completely trusted way. There's capability information, you know, those, those capsules, time capsules, admin, and all these kind of things. So we can actually make that uh, use for that for, for, for doing our more interesting kinds of authentication. Um, there's audit information, there's quite a bit of other stuff. There, I think there are about a 30 or so different bits that you can actually turn on and then get information about from the other side. There was Um, what, what exactly? Yes, it's extensible. It's also, I mean, this is a lot of data, right? And we do not send this data around all the time. Um, the peer, like the receiving side, has to turn on what it wants to receive from the sender side. So, for example, something like a logging framework like the journal is interested in a lot of this data, right? Like it would, would know exactly from which context was a message generated. So we turn on a lot of stuff in there. But for most applications, they don't really care about all the fancy stuff if it's the, w what's the comma fed field of the thread. So they don't turn on this bit. And if they don't turn it on, then it will not be attached and things will be a little bit faster. And we can add a couple of uh, more bits later on like that. Um, yeah, there's implicit timestamping. For all the messages that are sent, you get two ti uh, three timestamps actually now. Um, there's the monotonic timestamp, which is basically this clock that always keeps increasing that starts at boot up. Then there is uh, the real time timestamp, which is that one. Um, then there is the, the, the uh, message counter, which is something we very recently added. Um, it's a way, uh, it's not really a time that you measure in seconds or something like that, but it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's basically every message that is sent on an entire system is, is it gets a, a one always increasing number, so it's perfect for reconstructing order. And the fancy thing about it is actually that you, you can use it to, to order messages across buses, right? Because um, Dbus Daemon has this concept of buses, so you have a user bus um, that is specific to a user, and you have a system bus that is uh, uh, specific to the entire system. And with these, these message counter things, you can actually order things across the, the, the entirety of, of all the buses on the system. So you know exactly that this user has sent his message on his bus before somebody else sent it on his bus, right? Um, it is always available because it's a kernel fa facility that's set up really, really early at boot. Um, you have it from earliest boot up to latest shutdown. It's always there. Um, which is incredibly useful for us as, as uh, lower level operating system developers because we don't have to care any about anything anymore. We can just make use of it whenever we want. Um, it is open for LSMs, for, for Linux security modules from the kernel, to hook into, into all the uh, decisions um, from the kernel side. So as a Linux and whatever else there is, they can actually um, do that on the kernel side. They don't even have to, to, to ever leave kernel for, for making these decisions. Um, the activation of uh, KDB services is actually pretty much identical to the activation of other services, right? The user space that we wrote um, lives in systemd, and um, in systemd, regardless how you start a service, it's always the same way. Um, you'll always run the same context, so you can freely choose if you want to activate your service by hardware, by sockets, by, by uh, bus activation, by boot, um, or whatever else. You will always run in the same, same um, environment, the same way. Um, there's no, no inherent distinction anymore. Um, the user space is much simpler in, uh, in, in, in KDBus because the kernel does quite a bit, um, but um, user space um, doesn't have to deal about much of many of these things. There's no XML involved or anything like that. Introspection is the only one where we still do gener generate XML, but the good thing about uh, generating that kind of XML is that we can actually, it's a printf, right? It's, it, it doesn't, you don't need an XML library. I mean, ideally I would even get rid of that uh, um, XML because it's also completely linear, as I said, that doesn't need any of the structure stuff. Um, but it's, uh, um, yeah, also it's only like the, the, the parsing side is only um, needed by some language bindings that have generators that can generate code of, out of that. Um, uh, 
Um, so KDBus is inherently something that is not a network transparent. KDBus is something that's about local IPC. However, the, the thing that we put together here is actually from the user space side, if you, if you, if you just <laughs> use the, 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 the libraries, um, you will not see the difference in much detail at, le at least um, from, from using KDBus, which is going to be really fast and, and, and have a, a lot of things that you don't have across a network like identity information, things like that, do not make sense to send over the network. Um, but um, regardless what transport you use, you will have basically the same API. Now it's up to you, of course, to make use of the, like, like for example, if you rely that you can actually send gigabytes of data and no time over it, which will work fine in KDBus but will not work uh, that fine on the network, then it's your own fault basically. But uh, for, the, for the simple cases, um, you can write something um, that is completely network transparent, doesn't care if it's over the fast or the slow way. Um, well, I mean, I kind of tried to make the point with all the earlier stuff. Like, for example, this one does, does all the access control over the services. It's like, it, like the kernel has no idea about all these things that you send files. I mean, it's, it's basically the difference. One is a high-level IPC. The other one is really this low-level thing that only cares about streams. I mean, you can't build that. Dbus daemon is exactly that, right? But send file send is file always is not, it's not about sharing. Send file is about sending. You cannot give it away, just so, so you don't have it anymore. I mean, send my ma is like send. this stuff is basically everybody keeps his data and you just give somebody else also a view on it, right? Send file, however, is something you actually get rid of the data, right? You give it away and then it's gone for you. If you not give it away, it's a copy send file. So you have to give it away to make use of send file. And this is about sharing stuff, not about gifting things. I don't see how that applies to virtual machines, um, but uh, through containers, I mean, the KDB stuff is a kernel thing. If you have a file descriptor to it and pass a file descriptor through containers, then you can t certainly do that. The, the client-side library that we wrote actually um, uh, has, a, has a way how you connect to the, the system bus, how you connect to the user bus, but it also has a function how you can connect to remote bus, which will go via SSH, and then um, how you can co connect to the system bus of one specific container that's running on the local system. And then we'll actually enter that, that, that container, get the file descriptor out of it, and you can talk to it directly. This is actually used by all the systemd commands, like system control and things like that. Um, so you can actually specify system control dash M, specify container name, and then this command that you wanted to execute is not executed on the local system, but down in the container. So it's completely natural, it's fast, it's integrated, it's actually kind of pretty. Okay, um, then there's this thing that I mentioned with the raised free exit. It's kind of uh, um, uh, solved as with KD, but you can actually easily write services that uh, do exit on idle and do not lose, lose context. Um, yeah. So, um, so much about like what we can do. If nobody has questions at this time, um, there's a question. So the wedding people are certainly interested, but the wedding people have a different needs sometimes, um, like for example, our emphasis is on IPC so that if you send a message over, then the both sides can be sure that the other side cannot modify the message, right? Which is a distinction from shared memory, right? On shared memory, if you send somebody access to your shared memory segment, then usually the other side gets as much access as do you have. So that side can, can the, the change the data under your, while you have will change it, but what, what's even more problematic is that you can still change the data uh, for the other side. All right, the bitmaps, like, like for example, if, if, if Waylon wants to share buffers and things like that, shared memory might actually be the right thing, you know, because they actually want the reflection of the... Yeah, I mean, for input devices, you can certainly use that. Absolutely. I mean, the Android um, has this binder thing, right? It's, it's, this stuff is a little bit inspired by that. We will probably never reach the, the performance that Binder does because Binder does a couple of compromises that we will not do because we need to be this general purpose thing and they don't. But anyway, this binder thing is... It, we are very close to, to binary performance, um, but the, the Android, uh, what they call um, um, display flinger, or so, um, is actually built entirely on binary. So if they couldn't do that, we could do that too. Um, again, I, I mentioned that earlier, like for the network transparency stuff, um, the, the, the user space, um, it's, it's not visible to most applications whether you use that or use that. Uh, 
Okay, let's switch to one of the later slides here. Um, or actually, is that the one? Yeah, GDAS uh, support is coming soon, also the libdebug one support. So currently, uh, um, we, we, we've created a new library called libsystemdebug. The reason why we created that is because libdebug is not fun to use with, and we actually really want to make sure that everybody who does low-level systems programming actually uses this library uh, or uses KDBus instead of in, uh, inventing their own IPC because we have seen that so often in the past that people have invented their own IPC and wasn't that great. Um, so we created a new library. That one uh, from day one um, spoke KDBus and the old socket thing in parallel so you can connect it to anything. Um, however, of course, almost nothing's written with that currently. It's the only system itself um, plus a couple of people who are crazy enough to do this, use this early um, code. But uh, so it's definitely our intention that GDBus, which is implementation in glib, and libdbus1, which is implementation, uh, the, the, the previous uh, reference implementation that is being used by Qt and a couple of other things, um, that those can natively speak to KDBus as well. Um, we have Ryan Lorty is currently working on, on porting GDBus over, and uh, there are people from Samsung who are currently working on uh, uh, porting libdbus1 over. Um, as soon as that's done, applications don't have to care. They can use either of those three libraries and um, the right thing will happen. However, we also provide compatibility for, compatibility for the old socket protocol, right? There is a translator in place so that you can actually connect to the classic AF Unix socket and it will, you will actually talk to a proxy and that proxy will take all the data and uh, uh, send it over to the other side um, and then give you back the data. Um, and that, that actually... Exactly. Um, The system best quality, yeah, well, okay, we do not provide perfect compatibility. Like, um, for all user applications, um, the compatibility is pretty much there. However, for system applications, um, because the policy in classic DBus Dimmon was so badly designed with the XML stuff, you know, policy is something that only applies to the system bus and never so applies to the user bus because the user bus, everybody uh, trusts itself anyway. Um, but for the system bus, the policy <laughs> is so bad of DBus Dimmon because it goes and alters methods and does all kind of things that we, we um, came to a completely different way. Like basically the kernel will in, in enforce a very um, limited set of policy that is more model about uh, like, like Unix access rights to files, right? Like so, so you basically have those, those um, you can say, yeah, give access to this user to this service uh, or this group to the service. And then you can, you can do a couple of different things with it, like own the name or, or, or talk to it and things like that. Um, so it's more model like Unix, and then we expect that um, uh, client libraries, if they want to do more uh, fine-grained uh, policy control, like actually um, policy control on different methods and things like that, that they then have to do that in, on their own in user space using more complex logic. Usually we, we would uh, um, re um, request people to use PolicyKit for that, because PolicyKit is basically a framework for authenticating these methods. However, it can do interactive things and things like that, which are uh, highly desirable. Um, we make this a lot easier to use policy kit and, and, and uh, other kinds of checks because we, as mentioned, um, support this thing that we you can actually attach capabilities and, and all these kind of things to messages. So our suggestion would be there, if you want to have it simple and want to do per method um, uh, uh, policy control, use this capability information. Then for the fancier bits, um, hook and policy kit, absolutely. Um, and yeah, the kernel will do a little bit of basic um, uh, control. Um, also, the policy stuff is actually then hooked up with sandboxing, so which we can use for apps later on, but that's a completely different topic. Um, um, actually, the new library um, that cares for the policy thing very nicely. So if you, in the new library, define um, like an object and you list all the methods in there, then there's one flag which actually uh, indicates if something is, is privileged or not. And then the library will do all the, um, the stuff automatically for you and look for the capability from the sender and things like that. There was a question. Well, I mean, you can't do that, right? No, it can't. No, it can't really. Um, I mean, it, you will never get the performance um, back. No, you couldn't. The, so, the, like, like the inherent the problem with that is, is um, that where what I mentioned earlier is this trust thing that if you send something to somebody else that you cannot change it anymore and confuse the path on the other side which looks at the data and tries to decode it and then underneath it changes from your side, right? Which is the security problem. And you need this um, uh, lack of, like, like that you don't have to trust the other way either, right? Like so you need to be sure when you send something over that the other side doesn't change it for you and the other side needs to be sure that you don't change it. Which is actually, uh, um, yeah, so Dbus classically um, provides it simply by copying it over, right? People have then completely distinct copies and 
they can do whatever they want with it. Um, KD was provides that by providing something like ceiling, which we probably won't cover anymore, but uh, which is super awesome. Um, and uh, it basically um, also makes this disconnect. But if you use shared memory, for example, you do not get this disconnect because you cannot send somebody over your file descriptor and then be sure that he gets less access than you do. Nope. I mean, you can you can put together a message with the new with the new libraries and with the new code, and that li a message can be a gigabyte in size, and then you can send it over KDBus and you will send it over the old one. And both of both cases will work. In one time though, it will take awfully long, and if you're lucky, uh, the DBus daemon will actually enforce some limit and tell you that you cannot send messages this large. If you're unlucky, it will just be horribly slow. Any uh, questions? Okay, let's uh, focus on the zero copy thing. Uh, see that those 100 slides. Uh, so there's a concept, I got like seven minutes left, so we'll touch one more concept here, which is MAMFDs. MAMFDs are something that we implemented for users with KDBus. Um, as the name suggests, it's about file descriptors for memory. Um, so it's a bit like a, like a, 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 um, like a file descriptor that you have on a file on uh, slash temp that has been deleted, right? So it's something that as long as a file descriptor exists, that memory exists, you can map the memory if you have the file descriptor, but as soon as you close the file descriptor, the memory is gone and everything is free. Um, now the question is, if it's so much like slash temp, why do we need that? That is because it's also very different from slash temp in that it actually supports ceiling. Ceiling is something, is an operation there which basically um, uh, indicates that if you do not have a, the file mapped currently, um, then you can seal it, oh, and nobody else has a, has, a, has a reference to the file, then you can seal it, which basically means now it's immutable, <laughs> right? Now it cannot be changed anymore, now it's read-only. Um, so if you then go on and map it, you can only do so read-only. Now, um, you can send these file descriptors over uh, KDBus, and then KDBus will deliver to the other side because they are sealed and because KDBus actually can enforce that while they're sent over, they must be sealed. The other side can just map them and can be sure that they are not modified and below, right? So this is, this is how we do zero copy. Now what's interesting is um, uh, normally what, uh, what uh, KDBus does to send message to the other side is they just tank, take the message how you put it together and just directly copy it to the receiving uh, buffer on the other side. Every other side basically has a little bit of a buffer set up where all these messages end up and then it's notified about this message having been dropped there and it will take that. We use the MAMFDs to, to transparently extend this model to also sup support zero copy, right? So. Um, how this works in the in the um, systemd in the lib systemd bus uh, 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 client library is that every time you send a message, it is first put together inside one of these mem MFDs, right? And then when we notice that you that your message grew over some threshold, we will actually send the MFD as file descriptor over. If it is stayed below that threshold, we will actually do the normal copy thing, which basically means in 90% of the cases where the message will actually be just small because it's control data, then you just copy it over and that's it. If, however, it grows over this range and becomes a couple of gigabytes in size or whatever, um, then we actually send the, the MAMFD, we seal the MAMFD, we s uh, the kernel will enforce that it's a sealed MAMFD that we send over, the other side can map it and can have direct access without any copying involved. That's what we meant is normally it's, it's single copy, however it can be zero copy if that's desirable. Now the threshold that I was talking of um, is actually now as I said 512K, we figured that out. Now which basically means that up to 512K, uh, 12K we will copy rather than do this um, MFD jump. Um, and now that's interesting, right? How can it be that copying things once is actually faster, like, like why, why do we pick 512? I mean, we do it because it's faster, but why can it be that it's faster to copy things once than to just give the reference to the memory to the other side? The reason for that is simply that on Linux, um, memory mapping is really fast, uh, it's really slow. <laughs> um, so, so basically, modern computers, mo modern processors are optimized for copying things around because that happens all the time. However, setting up new memory maps is not that fast. So, uh, because it uh, flashes, uh, flashes all kinds of, of CLBs and things like that. So, um, yeah, the, the, network, uh, the, the, the net result of that is up to 512K is actually faster to copy things rather than to just pass the file descriptors around. If we go beyond that threshold, um, then we do the zero copy thing. Um, so 
That's a good question. Um, this has been discussed. Like, I mean, Mammoth is how we currently have it, and it has a, a couple of other nice features, like we can label them and things like that uh, in a nice way. Um, there is this new thing in the kernel called OTEMP file, um, which basically allows you to create a file on slash TMP without ever having it linked in the file system, but having it uh, deleted all the time. Um, it's close to that, and then people could go and, and, and add a functionality to the kernel, like an app control. This, this has been discussed with Greg and things, and people like that. Um, so that it can actually seal normal files with that. Um, no, normal files you probably never can because they, they might be like a few zip disks used and all this kind of thing. So you always have to limit it to temp at that. But uh, uh, um, that's, that's definitely is one approach that some people want to make happen because there's an, a framework from the Android people which is called Ashman, which is similar to this in some semantics, however completely different in others. Um, and they're interested to use the same, same basic building block there. So we are open to making this for app control happen. Um, however, there, there's more than just sealing uh, would have to happen um, for the tempfs. There's naming and things like that as well. But uh, the OTEMP file stuff, basically, all files that you create with OTEMP file have basically no name. They, 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 they can't have that. You cannot figure that out. It, it could be made generic, and there's like 10 steps to go there, and people stop after the first one, <laughs> so li like usual. You can actually unseal it, but only if you are the only one who has a file descriptor at that point, and if nobody has memory mapped it. Okay. So it's because in that case, nobody cares, right? It's yours. It's actually perfectly isolated. Uh, this is more like a device driver. It, uh, like the, the way how you get into this stuff, like how you open the, uh, the, the, the interfaces is by opening a device file and slash dev, right? Or a couple of them, actually. Um, and uh, so it behaves in most ways exactly like a device driver that you can compile as module. And I mean, we compile it as module because we test it all the time. And um, it, it's not part of the core kernel, which is like, I mean, we let's go to the last slide there again. <laughs> this one. Um, yeah, it works as an out of three model uh, uh, module, um, and uh, it's it's our hope how we can politically get that right so that it actually merged soon. Our plan is to get this merged in 2014. Um, of course, there have been two attempts before ours to get Divas into the kernel, and those failed grandiously. Um, now uh, we have Greg on, on on our side and, and things like that, um, and we try to isolate it from the rest of the kernel so much that I mean nobody says no to to kernel modules. That, that clock's not right then. <laughs> So um, yeah, b b b we, we think we got the politics a bit better, so we are kind of hopeful that we get it into the kernel without too much, too many issues. And big part of that is that it's a kernel driver that's so isolated, and nobody says no to kernel drivers. People say no to, to core kernel changes, but we don't do that. So my time's over. All right, like uh, tomorrow there's a system me thing, right? And we got like four hours and. And if you want to know more about KDVS, um, then uh, the slides will be up uh, online so you can see the other 50 slides if you care. Um, if you, if you uh, yeah, Google for the URLs, um, yeah, there's everything split up between the KDVS repository for the kernel bits and system repository for our user space. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time. If you have further questions, ask me outside.